Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. I'd like to give a special greeting to anyone who may be visiting with us the first time. We are grateful to have you come worship our God together. Thank you for those baptisms. We pray for those two young ladies as they begin to journey their life of faith. Well, last week we looked at a video as we closed our service for our school. That was a very sobering time for me, the, the degradation of society, what's happening in politics, the giving over of a nation. It just gave life to Philippians, to me, that this is what we are to gauge in. We need darkness, Paul said, for the lights to shine. And we are to be the spiritual Milky Way here at Southside Bible Church. We're to be citizens from another world. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's our boast, our hope, and our joy. And it knits our hearts together after living in this world all week where we come united to worship our God. We give our lives to this church, the people, to see Christ formed in one another. And we use our gifts and we pray for the growing of our faith so that God would be glorified as the supreme worth of all things. Paul said to get distracted with our own glory, our own selfish desires, and our own hurts will hurt this glory. The spirit of the age of criticism and attack and writing one another off is not in the body of Christ. Rather, stars who are shining the glory of God with humility that have the mind of Christ who left glory and humbled himself to the point of becoming obedient on death on a cross. And we're to love as we lay our lives down and we serve one another. That is the need of the day. And that school is just a piece of the puzzle that all of us are to work together to raise up generations of righteousness. And we're to meet one soul at a time and love them and speak the truth to them and model the gospel with our words. Um, we are to buy our lives. We're to have koinonia together. We share in this gospel. And then hard words that are spoke to me or gossip behind my back, it's not such a big deal to me any longer, but the shining together in unity in the gospel is the greater thing over all. And so we're called to lock shields together at any cost, even life itself, to lift high the cross of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to finish up Philippians Chapter 2, and the application will just be for all of us to slow down and examine our hearts and see, did I just learn things, or has God changed me into this humble man or woman washing the feet of the saints? So Philippians 2, verse 19, Paul said, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly." And then he moves to our passage this morning. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all, and he was distressed because he had heard, you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow." Therefore, I've sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on the word this morning. Father, I pray that you take these words now. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate them to every mind sitting in this room now? God, let us understand the mind of Christ, the truth that was written in these words through the human instrument of the Apostle Paul, led by your Spirit. God, help us to, to get it in such a way that our lives would become like what we're reading about in this passage. God, I pray that you would conform us to the image of Christ. 
I pray in this selfish, uh, self-glorying world that we live in, God, that we would come out and be separate, that we'd be those who have been taken up with your glory, and we'd be those who walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and have the mindset that he had, and that we would humble ourselves, God, and it'd no longer be about our glory, but yours and yours alone, and that we would give our lives to make much of Jesus Christ by loving the brethren. God, thank you for this passage. Work in every heart now, individually and specifically, for what they need to hear, see, and grow this morning. God, let this be an hour of worship. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning we will finish up, Lord willing, Philippians chapter 2. It's a big deal at Southside if you're visiting. Whenever we finish a chapter, it's a celebration. So... uh, It's been been a little while, but we are there, my friends. The Lord has been good to drive home in our hearts, Philippians 1.27, what is conduct worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been personally blessed in this section, and I want to work out my salvation with fear and trembling to be this kind of man. This conduct is essentially a call to humility, sacrificially serving the saints without grumbling or disputing. And we've looked at some examples, that of Jesus Christ, who left glory and entered this world to save it. We looked at Paul, who said, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering upon the faith of the Philippians. I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to give my life for their furtherance, their faith, and their growth. We looked last week at Timothy, who Paul looks around and says, there's no one else like him who has a genuine concern for you, so I'm going to send Timothy to you. And now this morning, we're going to look at Epaphroditus. He's not as um, popular or as famous, but if I had any more kids, I think I would name him Epaphroditus after my study. So I know we're having a lot of children lately. Consider Epaphroditus. I'm so glad that God gives us models. He gives us role models. And so much of what we do can be picked up by observing what other people do rather than just hearing about it. Conduct will come from imitation. And so role models are essential the way God has designed the Christian life. And so I love to read biographies. I've been majorly impacted by Hudson Taylor and John Newton. Um, they, They just make a profound impact on us as we watch them live these exemplary sacrificial lives. They show what can happen to someone who does humble himself and begins to live like Jesus Christ in his power, and they're conformed to him. And so these examples matter, and they're encouraging, and we need them in our journey. So please don't underestimate the power of example. And when I read all these books on parenting, you can read them till the cows come home. But I'll tell you right now, the power of example is going to be more important than anything else that you're going to learn about parenting. So many of you teach me daily as I watch you endure and trust God in the hardest of trials. Epaphroditus is still modeling to us 2,000 years later. I love, this is weird, but I love memorial services. I love where you come and you gather and the power of example of the person who has gone to glory fills the whole room with the aroma of Jesus Christ. And it's always those people who had the mindset of Philippians 2.5 and they lost their lives to love other people and and the whole room just fills as, as people share testimony about their life. I think the worst thing to me is to gather at a funeral. I did this with a friend of mine. His dad owns half of Colorado. And he was filthy rich, and and everyone got up, and all they could say is, he worked hard. He was a hardworking man. He gave up his family because he had an important job. And I just, that's weightless. That's, there's no glory in that. Glory is there's a weight. Christ becomes everything to you, and you live in such a way that God gets the glory in Christ. Light shines. And so I just want to call us as we begin this morning to example, to to give people role models to follow after of those who will not turn away from Jesus Christ. So in light of this, I'm, I'm excited about what we're going to look at this morning. I know that's hard for you guys to picture. 
My favorite attribute is always the one I'm studying. My favorite passage is the one I'm studying. And my favorite role model is the one I'm studying. So Epaphroditus, I think he's the one who gets closer to our lives. Paul is probably, he's the most gifted apostle who ever lived. And I love his example, but he always feels a little far away for me. And Timothy, the protege, gifted incredibly, a great leader in the early church. I kind of look at him and he's so far out there. But Epaphroditus is someone I can bite into. He's more real to us. He's just the average Joe. He was not the great church planner. He's just a faithful, humble, godly man of everything that we've been learning in Philippians 2. So here's a role model that's going to be put out this morning that I think can really encourage us, stir us on, and it feels a little more attainable to us. One preacher said, this is the people's model. This is, this is one that we might be able to get a little closer to. And so let's set the stage again. Paul's under house arrest in Rome. He's apparently chained to a Roman guard. He has some kind of freedom in ministry. <clears throat> He's been incarcerated for two years at this point. And the Philippians wanted to help Paul out as he's in prison. Because back then, they, they don't feed you in prison like they do here in America. So you had to get taken care of. And this church had collected money. And they sent a faithful man with the gift and to come bring other things and to help the apostle Paul. And his name was Epaphroditus. We know very little about this man. We don't know who his parents were. We don't know his background. We don't even know his role in the church. But one thing we know, Epaphroditus was a common name for the day. Aphrodite was the goddess of love. Epaphroditus was the favorite of Aphrodite. And so most likely, the one thing we do know is he, he probably comes from a pagan background. <laughs> so at some point, this man's been converted we don't know when. A lot of the commentators think maybe in the early church in Philippi, he was one of the early converts. We know that he's from their church, and he's told to go stay with Paul and serve him in his personal needs. And that is what has brought this man to Paul. So this connection between the church at Philippi and Paul, the expression of their love is Epaphroditus. So what does the Holy Spirit want us to know about this man? Well, look at me in verse 25. First is personal worth to Paul. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my needs. So I thought it was necessary that I sent him to you. And so what do you, what do you think the Philippians are going to think? They, they sent Epaphroditus to help Paul, and Paul's still in prison, and now Epaphroditus is coming back. So your, your thought is, is, what did he do? <laughs> Why did Paul kick him out? Is he the Jaja Vinks of Christianity? Like, why send him back? What, what did he do, Paul? So Paul starts by sharing with them what this man of God meant to him. He wasn't sending him back because he was of no use to him. Far from it. He, he has been a great and a very pre, pre, uh, present blessing to Paul. And so he begins by saying he's my brother. My is a, a personal pronoun. It's to show this is very personal to me. This is my spiritual brother. The term carries this uh, idea of a brother of common love, a brother of common affection. He, he's my friend. He's my comrade. So we've been knit at the heart together, and I love him in every sense of the word with Philadelphia, Philadelphia, brotherly love. And this is the bond that we have in Christianity. And I want to make sure you don't miss this, even this morning. Do you have this? This is what all Christians have for one another. Do you walk in here like, I get to see my brothers and sisters in Christ, the family reunion every Sunday. I can't wait to get here. And, and so just has this gospel broken in to where you get that we're brothers. This is the beauty of what Paul is saying. Don't let it slip by. Do you feel this way about the body at Southside? My brothers and sisters. And secondly, he's my fellow worker. The Roman army became such a power at this time when Paul wrote this because they began fighting in a different way. They began fighting shoulder to shoulder, shield to shield, instead of just individual upon individual, and they just started conquering and dominating other countries. And so that's the picture, shoulder to shoulder in the battle together. And so we're fellow workers. I think one of my favorite things is once every three months, two months, uh, all of the leadership, the deacon and the elders, meet together in that room over there. And I just love looking around the table as everyone's reporting about what areas they're overseeing and how it's going. And I just sit and smile at 
there's such a beauty of, of, of just our fellow workers for the name of Jesus Christ. And it just lifts my heart until 10 p.m. And after 10 p.m., I get a little bored with it. Like, could you share that next meeting? <laughs> so it's an interesting word. It's used 13 times in the New Testament and 12 of them by Paul. He uses it in regards to people who worked alongside of him in the advancement of the gospel. And so Epaphroditus is a co-worker. He's a laborer. He's diligent. He's not just sitting there and giving Paul a, a sip of chicken noodle soup whenever he needs it. They're shoulder to shoulder fighting for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this letter began with the whole praetorium guard is hearing the gospel and coming to faith. And these two are co-laborers. And then they're a fellow soldier. So he's not only serving in the advance of the gospel, but he's battling against the enemies we saw in Philippians 1 that are coming against the gospel. Uh, and there's, there's conflicts in the church. And so he's in the trenches with me. Uh, the word was used to honor a soldier and make him equal to his commander. It was a way to encourage them that, hey, you rank up there with the great leaders. We're all in this together. And so Epaphroditus is my fellow soldier in spiritual warfare. In the gospel spreading through the whole praetorium guard, he has been my guy. And so I acknowledge that, that he is your messenger and he's your minister to my needs, says Paul, and it makes him all the sweeter to me. Every time I look at him, I think of you, Philippi. <laughs> and you're just a reminder. He's a reminder of your love and your concern for me. We send cookies and brownies and you guys send Epaphroditus to show your love. So Paul uh, was not sending this man back because he was no use to him. He was an incredible use to Paul, which just exalts it. It's the example of Philippians 2, just this bright star of this kind of love and service, not looking out for your own personal interests. I, I love having Epaphroditus. He's helping me, but you guys are in need, so I'm sending him back. So just agape, sacrifice, humility oozing through this church. So then why are you sending him back? Two reasons. Look at verse 26. <clears throat> because Epaphroditus was longing for you all and was distressed. Why? Because you had heard that he was sick. So he's longing for you all. And it's the exact same word back in Philippians 1.8. Paul says, God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And Epaphroditus has this longing for the church at Philippi. He, he has a great love for them, and he's desiring their, to love them and be with them. And then Paul says he was distressed. And this is the same word used in Matthew 26, where Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me in the garden of Gethsemane, where he starts to sweat drops of blood. And so this is not some guy who's just homesick. I miss my bed, my family, home cooking. Why is he so distressed? Well, it's got to be his circumstances because that's what distresses us, right? Most of our burdens this morning are circumstances. Well, I want you to hear what it was. He's distressed because you, church at Philippi, heard that I was sick. The Philippians knew he was very sick, and it said even to the point of death, and so it must have been for some time because Rome was 800 miles away from Philippi. It would take six weeks to travel. And so news had already gotten back and forth. So he was probably very, very ill, and he was even close to dying. And the Philippians, who loved this man greatly, were concerned about him. And Epaphroditus is distressed and concerned for the Philippians' concern and distress in regards to him. So the amazing part to me here is that he's not distressed about all the circumstances because there were some hard ones, but he's more distressed about people, and I'm concerned that they're concerned about me and worried about my health. And so he's not focused on himself, he's focused on other people's interests. Does that sound familiar back to Philippians 2.3? Don't look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. The, the blessed freedom of self-forgetfulness is what the gospel can bring to your heart this morning. When's the last time you got distressed because you knew people were concerned about your situation? One preacher put it best. He said, we're into things and not people. We're just more worried about things than people. And this love and this genuine concern that we're learning here in the gospel. 
It's just the opposite of the spirit that's going on here. Such a genuine concern. Look at Paul in, in, in verse 27. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him. God looked upon Epaphroditus, and he showed mercy, and he healed him. He brought healing to this sick man. And Paul says, and not on him only, but he also had mercy on me. Well, how did he show mercy on you, Paul? Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. God showed me great mercy of of what a loss it would have been if Epaphroditus would have died. So God, what mercy you showed me um, by keeping this man alive. I, I was thinking of Austin and Claire Lees at our church. She's been battling cancer with the, after the birth of the new child. And I, I just, I, I, re, I met this couple in college in a little living room where we were doing a Bible study. And we just started bonding and growing and journeyed with them through their whole engagement. We, she got married in, you know, outside in a snowstorm. Um, just have journeyed with this couple and now to, to watch them journey where they didn't know if she was going to live. And these two had to, to live by faith. And I just remember how distressed my soul was driving away from the hospital. And when I got that report that this stem cell transplant, the first scan is that there's no cancer. Um, I can't begin to tell you the joy uh, to know that they were okay. God had mercy on me by having mercy on her. Let me give you a sense of how it felt for Paul. This is the same word where Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful. This is when Jesus dies, how sorrowful they're gonna be, but your sorrow is gonna be turned to joy when the resurrection comes. And so whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more for joy that a child is born, born into the world. Not many of you can relate to that. Um, Hebrews 12, 11, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, these hard trials. Yet those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So Paul says, my heart would have had sorrow upon sorrow, wave upon wave if Epaphroditus died. And so God healed him, and I'm sending him back to you. And so I'm just thinking about this. Paul could have just shook him and said, come on, Epaphroditus. The kingdom of God needs to be advanced. Get over Philippi. Get thicker skin. Let's just move on. But Paul had this genuine concern for the Philippians and Epaphroditus. They're distressed, so he's distressed. And we got to fight through this age, guys, in which we live, this isolated life, not caring about other people. Let the gospel of Jesus Christ open up your hearts till this is what comes out. Let the needs of others land on you and you give a rip and you care and you love and you lose your life for one another. That's what's going on. And this is lights. People will shine when you're not absorbed and lost in self and self alone, grumbling, complaining, disputes, factions, you start living like this and it's gonna shine. It's gonna just be bright lights all over this selfish, evil, hating, tear one another apart world that we live in. That's what this is about, the glory of God as we behold this and become these kind of people. And there's another reason why Paul's sending Epaphroditus back in verse 28. Therefore, I've sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned (coughs) about you. So I sent him back more eagerly. So when you see him, I just, I want you guys to rejoice over Epaphroditus when he comes back. And then I'll be less concerned. The Greek word there is the same word for anxious that he's going to use in Philippians 4, 6. I won't be so anxious, and it's a good kind of anxiousness of just worrying about you guys. I want to, I'll be less worried about it. And I was thinking about this, where Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I more so. I've been in far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. 
I've been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, and dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. But apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. And this weight that Paul had for the brethren. And this is sitting on them that the Philippians are burdened and that they're worried about this dear brother. And so it, it was a burden for Paul, that these, these concerns and these cares that he had for the brethren. He's not a self-focused man. Paul is the picture of Philippians 2.5. He, he's emptied himself. And it's no longer about Paul. It's just about others and their good. And so I just want you to picture what's going on here. Paul's in prison, dark days before an execution. He's waiting to hear about whether they'll cut his head off or not. It's got to be difficult. Many have deserted him. People are trying to cause him great distress by preaching Christ wrongly. We couldn't get to the bottom exactly what that was in Philippians 1. But God's given him some comforts in the middle of all these trials. He gave him Timothy, the son of the faith, one souled man. We're so like minded and one hearted. And Paul looks at Philippi and they're in need. They're having conflicts in their church and from without. And he says, There's only one person who will genuinely be concerned about your welfare. And so I'm going to send Timothy to you immediately. He doesn't look at his own needs and all that Timothy d does for him. In the midst of his most difficult situation, your needs are my concern. So I send Timothy to you. And now I got Epaphroditus who's just serving me lovingly and faithfully, helping me with all my needs. He's a true brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and he's looked out for my every need. This guy is a blessing. But I see your concern, saints in Philippi, for him. So my concern is for you. So I send him so you can rejoice in seeing him again and embrace this brother and celebrate. Then my concern will be lightened. Yeah, but what about you, Paul? <laughs> I'm a drink offering. I'm being poured out on the sacrifice of your faith. Paul said in Acts 20, 24, the first verse I think I memorized as a Christian. I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. I, in order that I may finish my course in the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. I don't consider my life as any account as dear to myself. It, what about you, Paul? I've been crucified with Christ. I've died. It's you. I want to go be with Christ. It's very much better but the reason I stay is for the building up of your faith. It's not about me, said Paul. My life is really not my own. I did die with Christ, and I live to see others built up in Christ. My heaven is not Jerusalem because here we have no lasting city. I'm going to one day depart this worn out, beaten body and I'm going to go be with Jesus that is very much better. And I just want to take anyone and everyone with me. Not a bad way to view your life. Let me be poured out as an offering upon other people's faith. That will heal a million broken things in your life this morning if you could be set free in that. And Paul says, in this is pure joy. Celebrate, rejoice, enter into my joy. This is the joyful life, the life that has died and been buried in Christ. Well, how should we look at people like Epaphroditus? What should the Philippians do with this man when he returns? Look at verse 29. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. Receive him, lift him up. This is a man who risked his life, it says. The, the word for risk, it was a verb to roll the dice. It was a gambling term, and it came to mean to expose yourself to danger. Uh, parabola in the early church, it was a, an association, parabolone, and it was to, it meant to go into homes where there were deadly diseases that were killing people, and you would go in and minister to them. 
And therefore, Epaphroditus risked his life for the cause of Christ. He, he came in great danger to go help the apostle Paul. Paul's hated. He's in prison. There's so much risk. And this man just goes. And he says, bring him back and honor such people that will lose their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last week, we had two of those families praying over our new elder, the Deckers, who are risking their life in what's called one of the most dangerous cities in the world, in Tijuana. And Family Alpha has sacrificed so much to try to bring the gospel to Northern Africa. Hold people like that in high regard. Pray for them, care for them, help them. It's amazing. We spend all of our lives trying to be secure. That's all America's about. And this is a risk for reputation, jobs, plans, even your own life for the cause of the gospel. We're to risk our lives to lift high the cross of Christ with our time that we have here. So that's my conclusion to Philippians chapter 2. And so I just want to speak to anyone who might have come in here this morning that you heard these baptisms and both these girls were lost in sin in nature's night and God broke in and revealed Jesus Christ and that life of sin no longer had taste and value. And now the value and taste is Jesus Christ. And so what we're talking about here this morning is you will never be able to quit living with your life as your center reference point. You're, you're born by nature, self-centered and selfish. We come in the world, if you don't get milk at the right time, you would kill somebody if you were big enough. Right away from in your mother's womb, you're conceived in sin and you come in bent and twisted with self as your center. And the rest of your life is just sorrow of learning that the rest of the world doesn't want to revolve around you. And it hurts and it damages and it, it, it can do a million things to us to damage and harm the sin and the brokenness that it's done. And Jesus has come to deliver you from this brokenness of you wanting to be your own God and your own glory and your own kingdom where he can come and wash you away all your sins because he hung on a cross and bore God's punishment for it. You could be forgiven this morning and you can be set free from a life of bondage to self. I lived in it for 20 years it's the most miserable thing I ever lived in where all you can think about is yourself all day, every day. Aren't you sick of it? I hate it. It just got old. Jesus says, will you come to me? Aren't you weary and heavy laden with just trying to be your own God, run your own world, get everybody to love you, approve you, be sad because they don't? Just says, aren't you tired of sin? Weary? Just such a burden? Come to me. So Jesus, and I'll give you rest for your soul. I will cleanse you, forgive you, bring you back to, to God as your center reference point. I will bless you. I will make you my children. I'll set you free from self to what we just read about where you'll love Christ and others. It's the most joyful life to be done with you and go love other people. The fulfillment of the whole law, to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors yourself. This gospel can set you free to do it. But without it, you're going to go try, and you're going to fail, and you're going to try, and you're going to fail, and you will never be able to do it. You can't change your nature. You'll never be able to make, it says, can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin or a leper his spots? Neither can you who are accustomed to do evil do what is right. You can't change your nature. Twelve steps won't fix it. Jesus Christ offers the salvation to you this morning. And so as we finish up Philippians 2, maybe that's what some of you might need. And Jesus is wanting to set you free from this bondage to self. It's such a miserable life. Come and find life in Jesus Christ and believe upon him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, let Southside Bible Church be like Philippians 2. God, let us never get over Jesus. Let us live in a gospel of a God who deserved all glory. And he didn't think of a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself and he became obedient. And he, he, the infinite took on the finite and he was born of a virgin and a stable and a manger. God, thank you that the King of Kings entered this world, not to judge it, but to save it. 
And God, I pray that any who hear my voice this morning would hear your voice. Your sheep hear your voice. Let them hear you calling them this morning to get up and leave this life of sin and come to him, the good shepherd, who will wash them from their sins and give them a robe of righteousness to where they can stand before their God blameless with great joy. God, please grant that to any soul that needs that here this morning. And let us as believers, Lord, let us one day be in the list of Timothy where we might be the ones who have a genuine concern for others, that you could send us to Philippi because we're not about our own lives and our own personal interests. Your gospel has set us free to go genuinely care about other people more than ourselves. God, thank you for a gospel that can do that to such selfish people. I stand in awe that you could have changed the selfishness of my heart. God, we cry out against our remaining sin that still loves self. I pray by your spirit we'd be putting that to death. It would be mortified and we'd be starved by the glory of Jesus Christ and his beauty and his glory and his loveliness would fill us up with love and sacrifice and humility to serve others. God, thank you for the blessed freedom of serving other people. God, use this in every heart. Make it now applicable for whatever anyone needs. God, would you do that in their hearts this morning? I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.